Well, good morning. My name is Mark Taylor. I'm the Dean. I'm privileged to say I'm the Dean of the John M. Olin School of Business. I'm here today uh, jointly with my, with my colleague, uh, Barbara Shaw, the Dean of the, uh, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, to, uh, to welcome you to, to, to today's presentation, which is indeed jointly hosted by Olin's Century Club Business Series and the Arts and Sciences Connection Series. And uh, today we have the pleasure of hearing from two uh, WashU professors from across the campus, Olin Business School Professor uh, Peter Baumgarten and Art and Sciences Professor Abram van Engen. And uh, Peter and Abram's cross-disciplinary presentation focuses on an interesting pairing, the intersection of, uh, of business and literature. And this is something that is certainly dear to my heart, and it's, it's not as unusual as one might think. I think Business is one feature of society, and another feature of society where we reflect is, uh, is in literature. Um, I think thinking back about how literature helps us, helps us reflect on organisational behaviour uh, is, is, a, is of great value. In fact, I was just speaking to a very good friend of mine, Panel Camp, who is the, uh, the head of the Performing Arts Department here, uh, and he actually studies business text, right? He was studying uh, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, the Theory of Moral Sentiments, and how that reflects back on, um, on 18th century uh, society. Okay, well, let me uh, introduce one of our presenters, and I'll ask Barbara Shaw to join me in a moment, and that is Peter Baumgarten. Uh, and Peter serves as a, as, a, as, a very, as a highly valued professor of practice in strategy and organisations here at Olin Business School. And he also serves... Uh, as the director of Olin's Centre for Experiential Learning. And prior to joining us, before we uh, attracted him, I should say, Peter was an associate professor of management at Hope College in Holland, Michigan. And now I'd like to invite my, my esteemed colleague, Barbara Shaw, to the stage, who will introduce you to Abram van Engen. Barbara. Well, thank you, Dean Taylor. Um, it is a great pleasure to introduce one of our great uh, arts and sciences faculty members, Abram Van Engen, who is an Associate Professor of English. Professor Van Engen also serves as the um, Interim Director of our American Culture Studies Program. He is a Faculty Fellow at the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics. Prior to coming to Washington University, he served as an Assistant Professor in the Department of English at Trinity University. His research interests include early American literature, the history of emotions, Puritanism, and American exceptionalism. He is the author of a widely acclaimed book, Sympathetic Puritans, Calvinist Fellow Feelings in Early New England. And that's been a book that's received some very positive reviews for its innovative look at one of the, uh, the underlying assumptions, almost a dogma, about that era. So now it's a tremendous pleasure to invite both Professors Baumgarten and Van Egen to the stage. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here today. Um, one of the things that I want to start with before I introduce elements of our particular course is to give you a bit of the vision of how this all came together. Uh, about a year and a half ago, when I was considering whether to return to WashU, um, I'm a grad of WashU, um, so if I had a name tag, it'd have some sort of green or red on there as well. I did my PhD here and finished in 2010. One of the things that was alluring to me about this particular institution uh, was this intersection of being relatively small from a school standpoint, so six to 7,000 undergrads, but incredible centers of excellence across the campus. So whether it's in English literature or whether it's in law or computer science and the like, um, there's a real possibility of, of linking those together to create significant value. But oftentimes we live in our own little bubbles uh, even here on campus at Olin, having two buildings, sometimes it's difficult to be able to cross campus to be able to see colleagues in other different areas. Um, but one of the things, and one of the programs in particular, that has gotten me incredibly excited about coming back here and being a part of this school once again is a program that's really intentionally trying to cross and teach across boundaries. And it's a program that exists for our undergraduates that's called Beyond Boundaries. And so before we talk about this particular venture of venturing across those particular boundaries of English and literature, I want to start by giving you a little preview of this particular program that we have across the school as a whole. Every day, the world introduces new challenges that no one academic discipline can solve. And on any given day, 
a new generation of student scholars are dreaming up solutions that only interdisciplinary study could make possible. Like Tinoola, who wants to build hospitals in rural Nigeria so her community can have better access to health care. Her ideas span anthropology, healthcare administration, and international studies. Or Harrison, a design thinker who is exploring architecture, mechanical engineering, and immigration to understand how we can transform our cities to better serve elderly or immobile people like his grandmother. Or Jenna, she did volunteer work in high school with kids who had suffered traumatic injuries. Now she wants to improve their quality of life by combining mechanical engineering and art to design the next generation of prosthetics. At Washington University in St. Louis, we've created a new interdisciplinary program for creative entrepreneurial students like these who want to make a difference. It's called Beyond Boundaries. Through a combination of curricular and extracurricular offerings, this program is designed to support students across disciplines, offer them opportunities for intersectional study across schools, and prepare them to address any challenge the world has yet to introduce. Beyond Boundaries program students are accepted to Washington University without a formal affiliation to any of our undergraduate schools, which include the College of Arts and Sciences, Engineering, Business, and Design and Visual Art. Students choose their undergraduate school at the end of year one. They are assigned to a faculty advisor in one of these four undergraduate schools who will work closely with students to help guide their coursework and academic pursuits in an interdisciplinary way. Beyond Boundary students are asked to be self-guided and curious intellectual explorers, forging new paths across disciplines while collaborating with classmates and mentors in other fields of study. The result is an innovative education from a world-class university that equips students with the tools necessary to tackle today's interconnected world. For more information, visit the Beyond Boundaries program online. Extending and teaching across boundaries to shape innovative thinkers. In fact, we have some of those innovative thinkers in this room right here. I think they actually get points, perhaps, for being at this lecture. So glad to see that you have some points. Um, so the question is, what do we learn by extending across these two particular boundaries, right? I see professors of law here, and I see professors of computer science. We could do a number of different disciplines to be able to reach across. But one of the ones in particular was the idea, perhaps, linking English literature and business. And what can be learned at that particular intersection? In fact, the other day I was spending a little bit of time with the students walking through how to think about entrepreneurship and essentially creating new ventures with several of my colleagues across campus, and in fact, alumni that are entrepreneurs right now. And uh, at the very tail end of that time, one of the students came up to me and he said, I I'm actually taking your class. I just want to let you know. And I said, thank you so much for joining. <laughs> Uh, and he came up to me and he said, well, what am I going to learn in this particular class? What can I learn about markets by virtue of looking at English literature and story? And in fact, today, that's a bit of what we want to be able to explore, because both of us believe that there is quite a bit to be gained, and you heard that a bit from Dean Taylor as well. There's something to be gained by essentially pairing together these two particular pieces. And in fact, we need some level of thinking about the moral complexity of markets in the world that we live in right now. Whether it's something around the opioid crisis and the role of big pharma and perhaps being complicit in regards to those particular decisions, whether it's elements around data privacy and how we think about the particulars around what of your information is yours or not and how, uh, for example, we should think about elections and markets coming together, or whether it's around concerns of data privacy. I was just speaking the other day at the American Bar Association, um, having a conversation around how we think about talent analytics, another course that we teach here at Olin. And those are questions that do exist at the intersection of technical expertise, philosophical big questions around what is yours versus what is an organization's, uh, legality, and I think to some degree, literature. And within business, in the last little bit, you've started to see some broader questions being raised about what are the stakeholders that we might need to pay attention to? What are the stakeholders that we might need to understand when actually moving towards a particular business decision? So whether it was Jamie Diamond or whether it was Jeff Bezos having conversations around what should business be doing, to some degree, what we're at is an intersection of starting to say, how do we approach these questions in a different way? And though we can approach them, approach them in ways like 
our traditional ethics course, in our traditional business courses, maybe there's a new way, a new way to reach across those boundaries to be able to create something new and distinct for Olin as a whole to start to shape these thinkers of the next generation. So uh, the first question to be asked then is why literature? I mean, what does literature do for us? And literature does many things for us, but one of the basic things that it does for us is it provides us with narratives and stories, and it provides us with theories as well about how narratives and how stories actually work. Why does that matter? Well, increasingly, there's uh, an understanding that narratives drive ethics, economics, and a whole bunch of other fields. We live in and through narratives that situate us in the world, orient us, give us a sense of what the world is and our place in it. Uh, so you have, for example, uh, Robert Schiller, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2013. His latest book is called Narrative Economics. Now, he built a whole career on the basis that we are more than rational actors and that the market is more than or other than a simply a rational place. Uh, emotions drive markets. Emotions drive decisions as well. Uh, and in his recent work, he's been pushing at, well, what drives emotions? And the thing he's coming to back again and again is narratives. And so he says, uh, I'm starting now with my more recent work to think that we have to look at the humanities as well. Thank you. Um, <laughs> appreciate that. He says, we call ourselves homo sapiens, uh, but that may be something of a misnomer. Sapiens means wise. The evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould said we should be called homo narrator. Your mind is really built for narratives, and especially narratives about other human beings. Another way to think about this is this has a, actually a long history. So uh, way back when, Aristotle defined human beings as rational animals. It was the reason, it was the rationality that separated us from animals. And that has its own pedigree uh, and crops up in a lot of different ways. So if you think about Descartes, uh, when he gets to the last thing, the thing he can't doubt at all, the foundation of all the philosophy, he says, I think, therefore I am. But maybe a better way to formulate that is to say that I imagine, therefore I am. Uh, that we are creatures of narrative and art first and foremost. We're imagining animals who inhabit our world in and through the stories that we hear and tell. So let me just give you a little story to, to illustrate this. Um, one of my PhD students, Paolo Lunin, uh, it's wonderful work at a place like WashU because you get wonderful PhD students. Actually, he just defended, so now he's Dr. Lunin. Dr. Lunin was telling me about uh, lectures that Frederick Douglass gave during the Civil War. Now, Frederick Douglass was a monumental figure, uh, a towering, um, orator, writer, politician. He was an abolitionist. He had escaped from slavery. And by the time of the Civil War, he was already extremely famous. So they asked him to give some lectures. And he stands up to give a series of lectures. They think he's going to talk about war, racism, slavery, emancipation, all the big issues of the day. And he starts giving a talk, a series of lectures, about pictures and about picture making and really a theory of portraiture. And as he gets in this, people start scratching their heads. He says, yeah, this might be a little surprising to you. You might think this is a little off topic. But he says, if you listen closely, what I'm actually talking about is all the rest of that as well. Because this is where it starts. It starts with how we picture other human beings. And we have to begin to imagine how it is that we come to the pictures we have of other human beings. And it doesn't just come sui generis. It comes to us from the pictures that exist out in the world. Those pictures form the pictures we make in our mind. The pictures we make in our mind then form other pictures that inform other people and so on. It's a reciprocal process. He says, if you want to deal with racism and with slavery and all these big issues that we're dealing with, we have to begin with the imagination. We have to begin with how we imagine other human beings. Stories are one of the ways that we imagine other human beings. And so you get more and more headlines like this, why companies need novelists. Google has been sending out various calls for humanities majors to, to work for them and so on. We know because we post all of these in the English department. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of them. But anyway, uh, so, so this is a novelist, Mohsen Hamid. Uh, his, his main job is to be a world famous novelist, which he does very well. Uh, this is what he says, stories are fundamental to how we think about the world. Nelson Mandela told a story about what post-apartheid Africa could look like. That story was persuasive enough to promote change, and it became reality. JFK told a story about putting man on the moon, and it inspired people and came to pass. These type of huge events were built on stories. And it's not just huge events. So if his main job is world famous novelist, his part-time job, his three days a week job, is to be, and this is his literal title, chief storytelling officer for a brand consultancy firm in London. So it's the little things as well. So brands, businesses, have long understood that stories orient us, they push us one way or another. And you've got to have your stories right. 
Uh, and so what does this have to do with business ethics? So John Hennessy is a, a recently retired president of Stanford. They were asking him about business ethics, and this is what, what, what he said. People are put in situations that require rapid decision making, and they have no background in how to deal with some of the ethical issues in that setting. They don't have a reference, they don't have a starting point, and because it's real time, they make mistakes. So I think our goal is to help educate them better so that they'll be a little more reflective and a little more cautious, and maybe think about things from a slightly different perspective than they would have otherwise. If there is one thing that literature offers people, and there's many things, uh, but if there's one thing, it's a slightly different perspective. In fact, that is uh, what novels offer, both between novels, from one story to another, but also within novels. So there's this really great theorist of, of the novel named Mikhail Bakhtin. And when he started talking about the novels, he, he coined this word heteroglossia which just means many voices. It's a fancy word for many voices. But what it actually means as he dwells on this theory is that none of the voices has dominance. Within a novel, you have a whole series of voices, none of which is the one that just persuasive and all the rest are just sort of made up. Each one of them is fully enfleshed. Each one of them is fully authoritative. And within a novel, he was looking in particular at the brothers Karamazov, where you have these brothers with really different perspectives about religion. But he says when Dostoevsky writes those brothers, he makes them fully persuasive. He fully inhabits the voices of each perspective. And as you read across that novel or any great novel, you move from one perspective to another. So if there's one thing that literature can give us, it is this sense of greater, further, better perspectives. I'll give just one more story about this. Uh, Flannery O'Connor was a short story writer, pretty famous short story writer of the 20th century. She was a sort of cranky and reclusive figure. And so somehow, this is very surprising to me, but anyway, somehow she ended up running a creative writing workshop for a bunch of eager students who wanted to write stories. And they were very eager for her feedback, so they're writing a story and they give her these stories. And her first comment to all of them was, I used to think that it was easy to write stories, and then I read all of yours. <laughs> so that gives you a sense of her personality. It's not easy to write stories. But what she says, what she goes on to say is, these are in fact not stories. What you have done is you've written arguments and essays and opinions, and you've dressed them up with some plot and a little bit of character. Uh, we don't go to novels, we don't go to literature for just arguments and essays and opinions. We can get that from newspapers, we can get that from cable news, we can go anywhere else for that. Literature gives us something else. Narratives give us something else, something beyond just an argument or an opinion or an essay. They help us to understand the ways that we structure ourselves uh, and our world and our place in the world through narratives. And if you think back to that Douglas example, the more narratives we come across, the more they'll reform the narratives that we have in our own mind and the narratives that we send back out into the world. So business schools have known this for a while in many ways. And in fact, if you think back to the methodology that guides much of our teaching, it's the case method. Harvard Business School pioneered this way of thinking where it says, let's not think about business problems in the abstract. Let's instead take them into particular stories. In fact, one of the courses that I teach here at the business school is power and politics. And over the last several weeks, we've been taking a look at particular narratives, guiding people into particular choices that they actually might make in the midst of those uh, moral, sometimes, decisions and technical decisions inside a workplace. Now, Nonetheless, we're saying there's something a little bit different here. Maybe there's a way to be able to extend those narratives a bit more. And though I love the case method in a lot of ways, the stories are, to some degree, flatter. Um, they are 10 to 15 pages. They give you a piece of what's actually going on. And one of the things that I attempt to get our students to be able to do is to enter into that particular story. And in fact, I think sometimes even when we're reading a case, we can kind of see it to some degree from the outside. Oh, well, why didn't this character just do this? Why didn't this business leader instead just do something like this? And it becomes easy to almost seem like you're the incredibly smart person that would see the entire story from the outside. With stories, with novels, and in fact, if you were to go back to Flannery O'Connor's description there, with things that move beyond just a description and a plot dressed up with some character and the like, when you have a, a brilliant story, whether it's Shakespeare or whether it's some of the novels that we're going to be looking at in this course, it gets a little bit deeper in regards to what we're dealing with. And I think to some degree what that helps people do, and our students do, is to expand their level of empathy and understanding, right? To actually enter into the particular character's life and experience, to be able to see it not merely from the outside, but to some degree from the inside. That becomes one of the values that we get 
from story and from narrative. Second, it's this idea, as we're going to test out in a short bit, to be able to practice moral choices in the midst of greater complexity. And so in a short bit, Abram's going to be walking us through a particular story that we're going to use in this course for you to be able to practice, just like John Hennessy said that our students need to be able to make rapid decisions around morally rich landscapes. The same is true in regards to what we can do out of this particular course. And then finally, um, if we want to create students not merely that are technical leaders, but have a broader sense of a moral imagination of where we're going as we move into some of these complex stories, each of these pieces become elements of what we're attempting to get out of our particular class. And so what I want to show you here briefly is some of those texts. This is not a course on the great books, because I think it's really hard to identify the great books. But it's a series of texts that we believe will become incredibly crucial to be able to create in dialogue in the midst of both the novel as well as current business dilemmas. And so, for example, we're going to be looking at James Baldwin, but we're also going to be looking at The Wire, right? one of the best TV shows that does some of the same particular skills as well. The Coffee Trader, How to Get rich, rich, uh, Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, which is written by Mohsen Hamid. Uh, a former McKinsey consultant turned chief storyteller and now famous novelist. Each of these stories, to some degree, starts to layer out a more complex landscape that our students can start to practice empathy, practice decision making, and start to shape and form some type of moral understanding. And so Abram's going to walk us through one particular example of how we practice this choice here and give you an opportunity to create some dialogue around those differences. All right, so what I'm going to try to do here is uh, rise of Silas Lap. So whenever I say in the English department, I'm going to teach a course on, on, on business and literature, the first thing any English colleague says to me, especially if they do an American literature, is, oh, so you're going to do the rise of Silas Lap? Uh, so this is a novel. This is it's sort of known as the first major m novel about a modern businessman. It's about 330 pages. I'm going to try to give it to you in about 10 minutes. Or at least the, the, last, the last little bit of it. Uh, and so what I do is I'm going to, so just... Keep this picture in mind, Silas, Mills, and one other guy. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start laying out the story for you. But we're going to walk through a series of decisions. And the same question will come up each time, should Silas sell the Mills? But if we want to we do this so that you can actually vote here. So uh, if you pull out your phones and, and write this in, you'll also be able to text if you text um, Baumgarten, the last part, to 22333. It was easier than Van Ingen, so we had to choose yeah, one right. of <laughs> So anyway, this is easiest, but it, you could also text uh, the last name there, Baumgarten, to 22333, uh, and then you'll have a chance to vote. So let me just start laying out the story. So here's a guy, Silas. Grew up on a farm, discovered mineral uh, on his farm that could make an incredibly successful paint. He becomes a millionaire. He really becomes a multimillionaire off of this paint on his farm. Uh, and so... Uh, Later in life, so he moves to Boston. Later in life, um, the paint turns out to be undercut by another group of people who found uh, a similar sort of min mineral that makes a better paint for cheaper. So he knows his paint business is basically going to tank. Uh, now, in the process, he's, he's come to own a series of mills. Uh, and he thought that these mills were worth a good deal of money. It turns out they also are worthless because a road has come through. That's the only way to get the goods to market. And the owners of the road are going to come and buy the mills, and they're not going to pay for them very much. So these mills are also basically worthless. So his paint business is going down. His mills are worthless. He knows that if he can get just scraped together enough money, he can invest in the new paint business and rise again. Uh, and so he just needs a little bit of money to get out and get started again. All right, so he's got these mills that are basically worthless, and along comes uh, this other guy. So I'll, I'll let you vote in just a minute. And this other guy says, hey, your mills look great. I love your mills. What did you pay for those mills? I'll pay you more for them, because I would just really love to have those mills. So at this point, Silas knows these mills are worthless. If this guy buys them, he's going to go down hard. Should Silas sell the mills? Let's just leave it at that for right now. Should Silas sell the mills? Here's his chance to get out. Uh, he could sell them at full price. Somebody comes along and says, I like the looks of them. Uh, should Silas sell the mills? We're tracking all these answers as well, so we can follow up. I'm just kidding. We're yeah. not, tracking. <laughs> not at all anonymous. No, it is. It is anonymous. <laughs> all right, so about two-thirds say yes, and about one-third say no, which tracks a little bit with the first time I sort of come to this when I teach in class. 
Uh, and when I teach this, uh, I taught this before in class, then uh, this whole debate about whether or not he should sell the mills comes up. So let's just hold that thought. Now let's say it gets a little more complex. Let's say Silas goes with the one-third people, and he says, you know, I, I, can't, I just can't do this. I need to tell you, these mills are basically worthless. And the guy says, you know what, don't worry about it. I already knew that. He says, the thing is, I represent this other group of investors. They have tons of money. They, they got so much money, they don't even know what to do with it. And they won't even bother losing a bunch of money because they, they can't even keep track of it. They gave me all this money. I'll buy your worthless mills. I'll pay full price for them. I'll save you. And, you know, in, in gratitude, you can just kick me back a little bit of money. All right? So I'll save you. You kick me back a little bit of money. It's this group of wealthy investors who have so much money, they don't even know what to do with it. They'll lose out on the mills, but you don't even have to worry about them because they're loaded. All right? So now, should Silas sell the mills? <laughs> All right. So one of the key questions here is what has changed? What has changed in the situation? We've offloaded the loss on the mills to another group of people, right? But what has really changed to make this, make the voting radically different, all right? So it's one of the things to think about. But the situation gets a little more complex. So we're not just dealing with these folks. There's another folk. Uh, there's another guy involved named Rogers. Uh, he can kick up on the screen there. So, so Rogers, there he is. Rogers went into business, in the paint business, with Silas early on. So when Silas found the mineral and found the paint on his farm, uh, he didn't have any way to capitalize on it. He didn't have any way to make it into a big business. Along came Rogers with actual money to turn it big. And just as the paint business started to explode, just as it started to get big, Silas forced Rogers out of the business. All right? Uh, and so he did it because he thought Rogers was no good at business. He appreciated the money, but no thank you. And ever since uh, the paint business went big, and Silas forced Rogers out. Rogers has been on hard times. All right, so there's one other factor. There's a couple other factors here. Uh, there's Persis. Silas is married. He's got, a, he's got a wife. It's named Persis. It's the 1800s, so her name is Persis. Uh, <laughs> if anyone here is named Persis, it's a lovely name. It should come back. Uh, but anyway, that's his wife's name, Persis. Uh, and, and Persis thinks Silas is terrific, just a wonderful human being, t t totally great, upstanding person. There's just one problem with Silas that she has. She's always held it against him that, she, that he forced Rogers out of the business early on. She says, you know, there was this key moment when greed got the better of you, and you forced this man out, and ever since then, he's been on hard times. Now, the thing about Rogers is he's connected to these mills, too. It's a long story, but basically the reason that Silas got a hold of these mills is because of Rogers. And Rogers will be saved now from all of his accumulating debts if Silas can sell these mills. And in fact, it's Rogers who brought him this other guy and said, please just sell the mills to this guy and you will save me and I can start over. Okay? So Rogers is also involved. There's one other factor involved. <laughs> they got a couple daughters. Silas and Persis have a couple daughters, lovely daughters, Penny and Irene. Uh, and really, they've only known one way of life, which is relative abundance. They've grown up ever since the paint went big. They've really only known relative abundance. They've lived a, a very happy, lovely life in Boston. But if Silas loses the mills and his paint business goes under, they're about to find a new way of life. So should Silas save his family, his daughters, from that other way of life, save Rogers and save himself and sell the mills? That's the question. We could take a vote. <laughs> okay, now we're back to selling the mills. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's a couple other factors. Um, there's a boy. There's Tom. Hi, Tom. Tom, Tom loves Penny, and Penny loves Tom. It's really very sweet. Uh, and, and, and Tom works for Silas as well. Uh, and Tom believes so much in Silas's paint business. He loves the paint business. He thinks Silas is great, and he thinks the paint is great, that he's willing to invest his own. He knows it's on hard times. He doesn't know the details. He just knows it's on hard times. He's willing to invest all of his own money in Silas's paint business to try to help Silas out. And, and Silas does not take the money. He's tempted, but he does not take the money. But he does sort of wonder what will happen to the sort of budding relationship between Tom and Penny, who dearly love each other, uh, if, if, if the paint business goes under. Now, one of the reasons he wonders about that is because there's a couple of parents. We'll call them Anne and Brahm. 
Uh, and uh, the reason Tom has a lot of money is because Ann and Brom have a lot of money. These are, in fact, old. The reason his name is Brom, Bromfield, it's not just because it's the 1800s. It's because this is old money elite folk. These are the inner circle of Boston. These people have had money for generations. They go back to the beginnings of Boston. This is the inner, inner circle of Boston. And Silas, who grew up on a farm, has always wanted to be a part of the inner circle, the, up, the upper crust, the elite of Boston. And now their son, Tom, wants to marry his daughter, Penny. And the issue is, what will happen if Penny is, for lack of a better term, penniless, right? <laughs> Uh, will the marriage go through? It does seem that Tom and Penny love each other regardless of the money, but at least the money is cover for why someone from the upper crust would, would marry a farmer's daughter. Uh, and so if they have no money, will the marriage go through? Certainly Silas will not be part of the upper crust that he's always wanted to be a part of. Uh, they've never really accepted him, even though he's had money, because he's, he doesn't have the right manners, he doesn't have the right culture. But there's a chance for his daughters to get into that culture, to get into the upper crust. All right? So now, these are some complicated factors. So, should Silas sell the mills? Let's see. We're, we're creeping up to no. So now we're at about two-thirds, yes, and one-third, no. All right, things are moving around, right? Uh, now, we're not going to vote anymore, but I just want you to know the situation is more complicated yet. <laughs> There's another guy. We'll call him Miller. That's not his real name, but we'll call him Miller. And he takes a bullet for Silas in the Civil War. He dies so that Silas can live. And he, does, he has a daughter named Zerilla. That is, in fact, her name. It is the 1800s. Zerilla. And, uh, and Silas has always supported Zerilla out of his debt to this guy who took a bullet for him. So one of the questions is whether he can continue to support Zerilla if he doesn't have any money, if his businesses go under. Right? So here's another complicated factor. Here's another thing to think about. Would it make a difference to you if these gr this group of wealthy investors in the corner, who are bound to lose a lot of money if he sells these mills, right? Uh, if they were not just a silhouette of faceless people in the corner, but we're actually characters with names. Would it make a difference to you if the novel also gave us their stories and told us about their families and let us know who they were? Because one of the things that novels teaches us is that nobody is, in fact, a faceless silhouette in the corner. That, in fact, everybody is a person with a story. And so these people, with their own stories, are bound to lose a lot of money if Silas sells the mills, right? Here's another thing. The only thing we know about them is what this guy has told us about them who wants to get a kickback on the mills. So would it make a difference to you in your voting if we knew, in fact, that these were not actually wealthy investors? What if they were a group of people who had cobbled together all of their last resources and trusted this guy to help them get a start? Would that make a difference in how you voted? The question here is, to whom and for what is Silas responsible in this situation? Which of these factors, if any, change the decision in your mind about what he should do with these mills. Um, and here's one of the sort of basic implications of this story. Remember, this is a 330-page novel, right? Abstract ethical thinking is good. It's necessary. Business case studies, they're good. They're necessary. They help us out. But ethical decisions never actually happen in the abstract to abstract people. They happen to particular people who always live in a particular web of relations. So one of the things that happens, so when William Dean Howells writes this novel in 1885, it's the Gilded Era. It's the rise of new money. It's the rise of millionaires, right? And it's almost as though he's sitting there in 1885 envisioning a business ethics course 100 years from now, right? It's almost as though he could see it happening. And what he can see happening is the rise of business case studies. And he says, all right, I'll write you a business case study. Here's a business case study. And he writes it, and it's about 15, 20 pages. He says, and then he says, in order to understand this business case study, you need to precede it with 300 pages of a novel about the characters involved, right? And so this decision about the mills is literally the last 30 pages of the book. And we get 300 pages about all of these characters before we come to this moment when Silas must make a decision about the mills. And there's a reason it's called The Rise of Silas Lapham. I'm not going to tell you what he does with the mills. You can go read the book yourself. <laughs> All right. I think our enrollment numbers just dropped precipitously upon 330 pages being stated on a live stream right there. So thank you. It's Adrian, a great novel. <laughs> 
One of the things that we're attempting to do in this course is to realize that these stories have corollaries in our modern day era. So for example, imagine taking the rise of Silas Lapham and putting it alongside the big short as a film and hearing about credit default swaps and people on the other side of that particular ledger. These are the ways in which we're trying to take historical dilemmas, narrative dilemmas that are incredibly rich and pair them alongside modern day dilemmas that start to, again, shape narrative, understanding, empathy, and moral imagination on the part of our particular students. And in a lot of ways, we tell a lot of different stories around the markets. And in fact, one of the most interesting things about pulling together our two distinct fields is that if you look at the humanities and you look at uh, the field of business, there are oftentimes very different stories we tell about the market in a more holistic sense. Moral stories about whether it's a good or a bad thing that's actually being pulled together. In fact, there's probably people, in fact, there are people across the school that are saying, can you actually do markets and morality together? Do those two things in particular fit together? Jonathan Haidt is a social psychologist who studied, uh, well, studied and then was eventually a professor at University of Virginia. And he's one of the leading thinkers in regards to moral psychology. In fact, we'll take many of his assessments across the course so that students start to see not only how they voted, but what their tendencies are in a more kind of abstract sort of way. Uh, Jonathan Haidt, was recruited away from Virginia a number of years ago and started working at Stern School of Business. And after a number of years basically telling people, you actually can't teach ethics, he was tasked with building out the ethics curriculum, curriculum at Stern School of Business. And so he started to think about how to do that especially well, developed a number of tools that we'll actually use in our course. But he started to realize that he would hear very different stories around the market and whether the market in a more holistic way is a good or a bad thing. And so I want to show you two of those different narratives, just to get us thinking in a broad sense. And my guess is that one of these may resonate with you, one of these may offend you, but I want you to hear them both. Because just like we talked about with novels, there's the benefit of being able to hear distinct sides of the story as we think about the moral complexity of the market itself. Once upon a time, work was real and authentic. Farmers raised crops, and craftsmen made goods with their own hands. But then, capitalism was invented and darkness spread across the land as the smokestacks of the Industrial Revolution covered everything in soot. The capitalists became ever more skilled at extracting productivity from workers and pocketing the gains from their labor. The workers eventually fought back by unionizing. In the early 20th century, as the brutality and stupidity of capitalism were exposed, many governments granted workers some protection from the predators. Democratic welfare states were born. But the capitalists and their right-wing cronies were unrelenting. And in many countries, they have destroyed the unions, slashed regulations, and given the corporations free reign to exploit at will. So the rich get richer, the rest of us get poorer, our democracy gets weaker, and the planet gets hotter. It is now the duty of every decent person to join the fight against global capitalism and the super predators it has unleashed upon us. Story one. Story one. Some of you are itching in your seats right now and some of you are getting ready to stand up and cheer. <laughs> There are distinct narratives that we tell. I'm going to show you the second story in a short bit. One of my colleagues, Andrew Knight, who teaches with me in the Organizational Behavior Group, uh, he and I are both runners. And we were talking about essentially our podcast routine, what podcasts we listen to uh, while on a run. And what he does on Sunday mornings is he takes a set of podcasts that are from the very different news stations that tell very different stories around capitalism. And this would be one that you would hear on particular stations. But there's another narrative that you might hear as well that I want to show you uh, as a contrast point to this as well. Once upon a time, almost everyone was a peasant, a serf, or a slave. Kings and feudal lords took most of what people produced, so nobody had much reason to work hard. But then in the 17th century, capitalism was invented and the liberation began. In England, Holland, and America, they discovered that when you give people property rights, the rule of law, and free markets, you turn on a switch in their hearts. People want to work when they can keep the fruits of their labor. They want to invent new products, provide for their children, and be useful to others. Free market capitalism enables them to do these things. 
In the 20th century, some countries embraced communism and centralized planning, always with the same result. Shortages of everything, including food and freedom. But countries that embraced capitalism have grown prosperous in a single generation. Yet, despite the evidence of history, the left-wing egalitarians are unrelenting, and whenever they get control of a government, their first target is economic freedom. The egalitarians don't want to live in a world in which people who create more value for others get to enjoy more wealth for themselves. They'd rather that everyone be equal and equally poor. It is now the duty of every decent person to join the fight to protect capitalism and to extend its blessings to all of humankind. A lot less laughter on that second one. <laughs> I hope these two videos made you feel somewhat uncomfortable, at least on one of the two of the different stories that you heard. But the question for us in this particular class is, can we help our students learn to find other ways? To be able to be empathetic in regards to different stories of the complexity of markets and the ways in which they are woven together with different forms of tensions, tensions between the people, tensions between particular ends, and help our students essentially empathize and envision in slightly different ways as they move in to being the kind of leaders that John Hennessy hopes that Stanford creates, that we hope that Wash U creates more broadly. And all of this leads to a question of how do we think about teaching? Again, in the midst of this, we're not giving you all of the course, uh, though you're welcome to take it if you're a student. You're also welcome to sit in at any point. If you want to hear a little bit more about what we are doing, feel free to send me a note. But what we're trying to do is to expand our teaching philosophy a bit. And I want both of us to speak about how this is a slightly different method from perhaps what we do in our other courses, and perhaps a bit of how we're approaching this in regards to the teaching craft itself. So Abram will start. I'll give you my own take. We'll show you a bit of the actual syllabus structure to show you how we're walking through this. And then we'll have some time for question and answers. So one of the things I love about a course like this is uh, it tends to draw students from across a political spectrum. It tends to draw students who will find themselves uh, siding with one story or the other more, more naturally. Uh, and I love to bring that kind of spectrum together in a single classroom. Uh, and so I teach another course uh, I've taught uh, four or five years now called A History of American Exceptionalism. The idea of America as a city on a hill. Where does that come from and, and what are the effects of it? And that also brings students from really different political spectrums together. And, and uh, it's impossible not to talk about politics in a class like that. But I tell them at the beginning of the class the same thing I'm going to tell students at the beginning of this class, uh, which is that I have political views. Um, but if I teach this course properly, you won't actually know what they are by the end of it. What you will think is that my political views are the opposite of yours, whatever yours are. <laughs> um, and so as I go through the course in American exceptionalism, whenever I get sort of the left wing side, whenever I get sort of the right wing side, what I do, uh, and it's, it's actually pretty fun to do, uh, but basically what I do is I try to give them the opposing, the most reasonable and rational uh, opposition to the position that they've just announced. Uh, because what I want them to do, not, I'm not trying to convert people, I'm not trying to change them necessarily from one to another, but I want them to say that if they're going to stick with their position, it needs to be defensible to an opposing view that they understand is rational. Uh, and it, they can't just sort of su assume that the other side is merely malicious. Uh, or unreasoning, that there is in fact reason and rationality to both sides, and they need to deal with that in order to defend their position. And so in this uh, course, I have views about the market, I have opinions about these things, but if I teach properly this course with Peter, the students are not going to know my own personal views about these things. When I hear students say in the one video, I'm going to give them the other video, uh, and I'm going to tell them, you know, what is your response to this rationality from the opposing side? How do you defend this, yourself against this um, accusation or this charge or this reasoning uh, position? So that's sort of the way I approach uh, my teaching philosophy in these kinds of courses. One of the things I love is to be able to hear from both sides and for students to really be able to struggle uh, with each other. I'll just say real quick on this point, when I teach Silas, uh, I've taught Silas a number of times, uh, the Rise of Silas Lab, and you always get to that point about the mills, and then I ask students what to do. And usually it's somewhere around 50-50, maybe one-third, two-thirds. It's so amazing because as they begin to debate what Silas should do, 
the arguments boil down to some version of, well, you just don't understand markets. This is just how markets work. And the other side will say, well, you just don't understand morals. That's not how morals work, right? Uh, and so you get, you, you get this conversation. And so that's really what I'm hoping to, our class will be able to bring together. I think from my perspective, one of the things I'm most excited about is the idea of bringing a richer type of case study to discussion. Um, it's really easy to, again, assign a 10-page case where these characters do feel a bit more abstract. And as you start to understand not just the characters with the richer complexity, but hopefully yourself with the richer complexity, you approach that in a slightly different way. Uh, I'll show you just brief snapshots here, uh, elements of what this course actually looks like. You'll see that in every particular section, there's a mix of literature, there's a mix, a mix of uh, common and complex uh, business cases that we're wrestling with, and there's also some psychological assessments. So you're making particular choices, and then you're saying, well, how does that relate to this moral foundation profile that I have? How, how am I able to get a score that maybe shows my particular style in comparison to Abram and starting to understand those pieces? And so we're taking, in a lot of ways, the best of social science, the best of literature, and some really complex and great narratives to be able to take our students into to be able to understand both sides as well as how to approach uh, these types of issues with greater moral complexity. So with that said, we do have a bit of time that we want to be able to open up the field for some questions about either the Beyond Boundaries program more broadly, about this course in particular, about how we can move from 330 pages to 130 pages on that case. We're going to talk about that afterwards. Just kidding. All 330 are assigned. <laughs> but we want to be able to uh, provide some time. So we do have two microphones uh, in each aisle, and we'll have about 10 minutes for question and answer. I was just at an event last night with Deloitte, and they were talking about this very same thing where your employees now want to be able to cross from going from one department to the next and that they need to be educated on this. So it seems that WashU, like always, proud alum, is out in front of this. And do you talk to anyone like Deloitte or, and to see where their research is and how it aligns with how you're doing beyond this? Yeah, I've seen some of the work that Deloitte has done in regards to um, shaping and, and moving people across different areas of the business to be able to shape their perspective on things. Um, what you actually see that's interesting is um, business education is obviously a critical part of educating business leaders. But if you look at um, uh, even some of the top uh, universities other than WashU, so Princeton, for example, doesn't have a business school. Harvard doesn't have an undergraduate business school. There are people coming out of economics and finance, uh, or sorry, economics and political science and English literature and philosophy. Um, so I think the question becomes, are there ways to do this in the workplace itself for rotational programs? And are there ways to think in a broader a liberal arts oriented approach towards our own education? Um, and I think this is a great example of us attempting to do that in regards to that work itself. The relationship to the Deloitte stuff, I'll have to think about a bit more, because I think it does uh, lead to questions from an employee development standpoint. If I'm running a company, how do I think about shaping leaders after they graduate from school? And we're trying to approach it, obviously, from the perspective of the students themselves. But yeah, that sounds like a, a great thing to be able to look at. Thank you. I could just add real quick Thanks. that, you know, uh, it turns out that most of our English majors do not end up becoming English professors. Uh, they, they, they go out into the world and they have a whole series of jobs. I had an undergraduate student this summer who was working on the, the so-called crisis in the humanities and what, it, what does that mean, what does that look like? And it's really a crisis of perception about job outcome. But there are actually plenty of indicators about actual job outcome. Uh, and humanities majors and English majors fare no worse or no better than other majors in other disciplines. Uh, and they have a huge range of jobs. And th this is all readily available, but it's not perceived. Uh, and so uh, she was writing all of, of this research up. It was just to say that when we teach an English major, um, we are cognizant of the fact that what we're, we're preparing students for is a world beyond just English seminar rooms. Uh, and so this kind of course allows me to be a little bit more explicit about that, which I appreciate. Um, but 
but we're, we're, we're always aware of the fact that our English majors are moving on into a whole array of businesses and law, law firm and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's part of our just sort of and I, I do understanding think of what we do. That's great. The, the way that we think about here at Olin, at least in part, and I'm sure that Mark can speak to this uh, as well, is there is this element around uh, data-driven and values-based being two of these core pillars. And so we want to teach people some of the technical skills around how to approach uh, particular choices and model out the particular problem. But what does it look like to actually uh, lean into the values-based part of this equation? Well, one part of it is understanding abstract moral philosophy. Some part of it is courses that I teach, like power and politics, that take people into particular cases. But I think we supplement that with elements around this more rich moral complexity there. Thank you. So I really appreciate what you're saying about the, the complexity of the situations, and I love the idea of looking at stories from um, multiple different perspectives and having full, rich characters and thinking about that in terms of the real life decisions that we make every day, right? Um, a lot of the examples, though, thinking about the, the poll we did, mm -hmm. the question was, should, Milas, should Silas sell the mills, yes or no? Mm -hmm. um, we have two videos, are we pro-capitalism or are we pro-labor. Mm -hmm. We have the 1% getting richer and the poor getting poorer. Mm -hmm. And we have left and right, right? So we, we know that this is much more complex than that. You talked about in your course, you, you want your students to think of you as having the opposite opinions of mm -hmm. what their position is. And they need to be able to defend their position. So I'm curious to think mm -hmm. about, you know, like how does the, how does the program, um, set up non-binary decisions, mm -hmm. right? Making this really, uh, you know, thinking about not just complexity of binary decisions, but third ways, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me give you one take on that, um, and then Abram, I'm curious your take is on this as well. Um, one of the framing uh, academic pieces that guides this work is by this guy, well, these two people, Forcade and Healy, uh, two sociologists at Duke as well as out of UC Berkeley, I believe. Um, and they look at all the literature around markets and morality, and they actually say it's not two. It's actually four different stories or narratives. And what they conclude is not just story one or not just story two, but really this idea that there's an interweaving of, uh, moral, uh, of a moral landscape inside particular choices that isn't binary in that regard. And so over the nature of the course, I would say that we're attempting to essentially build out that type of thinking, that it's not just a single or a a single choice with two different options, but a bit more complex than that. It's an interesting question as how we do polling, too. Yeah. Um, so do we um, provide opportunities to create some of the third ways, um, or actually have some of those discussions? In fact, if we had a bit more time, what we wanted to be able to provide was a space for you to share with someone sitting right next to you. Uh, how would you approach this choice beyond the binary? Um, 45 minutes, we, we struggle with that timing-wise, but yeah. that's, a, that's a great point. I mean, I just add that the, you, you, uh, in literary studies, for the last 40 years, binaries have been out. Uh, so if you go back, so uh, I don't know if you guys know anything about Derrida and deconstruction and all that business. But one of the things that, that came out of that was that every binary fails. Uh, and, so, uh, and so this has been just a sort of axiom of literary studies for the last 40 years, that there are no such things as binaries. If you set up a binary, actually it fails. Uh, and so. What's useful about these kinds of binaries is that it sets up a pole within which there's a spectrum. And so this is also the case when I teach American exceptionalism. It's not as though there's people who sit on the right and people who sit on the left and nothing in between. It's actually the fact that th there's a huge spectrum in between. And as you begin to debate with people, well, what about this idea? What about that idea? Uh, what emerges is the whole range of possibilities. Um, in our novels themselves, characters are seldom faced with a yes or no decision, actually. This Silas is, uh, that's why I call it a, a business case study at the end of a novel. Most novels are, in fact, a whole series of possible outcomes and possible choices that could, that could be made. Um, and part of what we're interested in is the way that systems and markets, as one form of systems, shape the possibilities, so the contingencies uh, among many different choices. So, yeah. It's a good point, and, and uh, I like to structure, open the structure, but then most of the course is exploring the space in between. Uh, I, I really enjoyed this talk, and I think it's extremely important. But one of the areas that I want to stress about is that 
I am very moved by how people change because of the narratives almost instantly, okay, from one side to the other. And that is extremely dangerous, okay? So I want to emphasize in this whole study or uh, exercise, we should also add in facts finding, mm -hmm. such that that will, should be, the facts should be part of the decision, not emotion, not, you know, feel good or whatever, but based on facts, mm -hmm. then it comes to hopefully get to the right right decision mm -hmm. and the reason i i'm talking so passionate about this because i'm finding that i'm from hong kong and this is what's mm -hmm. happening in hong kong mm -hmm. people are lacking of fact finding and allow all kinds of narratives mm -hmm. to bring you know mm -hmm. the uh, the whole university shut down which is crazy crazy mm -hmm. crazy mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll add one piece there, and I know we're getting, we got a couple other comments, so we're getting short on time. Um, one thing that's a part of that as well is we'd like to be able to weave in together some of the, the disciplines. Again, I'm a, an empiricist in regards to my social scientific training. There are particular facts, right? That, what does the data speak about this particular choice? And I think to be able to, again, create that dialogue, not just with story, not just with cases, but also with the information that we have out there around what's actually true, right? Some of these things are empirical questions that we want to be able to bring the scientific side alongside the humanities in that piece. And I think it's important to realize, too, that the narratives themselves build, up, build themselves up on a, on a series of facts. So even if we look at the Silas case there, it's a fact that those mills are worthless. Right? Um, that's a fact. Silas knows it. What he also knows is that other people don't know that. And so the question is not, that's not a fact-based question. That's an epistemology question. That's an ethics question. What do I do with, here's a fact, what do I do with the fact that other people don't know that these mills are worthless? Right? And so I agree with you. I, I, I don't want to move away. I don't want to say everything is just, if you build a, a story around it, anything is possible. Anything is plausible. There's this old, um, so in the 17th century, they used to teach uh, rhetoric and arts of argument by having people write one side of a case and then the next day write the other side of the case. Uh, and there's some really positive things about that, uh, forcing people to inhabit different perspectives. One of the reasons that got kind of tossed out in the 20th century is because it said, this is, you're just teaching relativism, that every case is equally plausible. Um, because if you write one side and you write the other side, you're, just, you're teaching them that any side is whatever you want to make of it. Um, and we don't want to teach just pure relativism. I don't think that's the goal of either of us. But it is the goal to say, you have firm ethical commitments. Let's examine the basis of those. And when somebody opposes you with firm ethical commitments and says, you're wrong on that, he shouldn't sell the mills, or he should, um, what, is, what are the actual facts that are being mobilized there, and what are the arguments being made about them? So that's part of what we'll hopefully be getting at in this course. So Mark, Mark Taylor. So yeah, I have just, just one quick question. Um, Last one. So the, um, you talk a lot about high culture here, right? 330 page novels, Brothers Karamazov and so forth, right? And that's, what about um, how you in incorporate so-called lower culture, popular culture? In, I'm thinking, for example, of uh, the, you know, the continuing popularity of the gangster movie from Little mm -hmm. Caesar in the 30s to Sopranos, The Wire, right? Mm -hmm. And gangster movies are really about business, right? Mm -hmm. There's no better businessman than a gangster. They've got a great sales technique, <laughs> right? Uh, but think about it, that's exactly what happens in the boom and bust cycle that mm -hmm. they have. It's like the boom and bust of the 30s and so on. I mean, how do you think about, and that's something that people absorb without really thinking, I'm gonna go and read this, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, this, this large novel, it's you know, popular culture. How do you build that into the course? Yeah, I would say from a, from a structural standpoint, we do build elements of that in. We don't have gangster films in, although that's, that's an interesting ad, yeah. um, especially given some of what we're doing, even with The Wire. So The Wire is a great example of that. Uh, we're taking a, a great um, a essayist, Gia Tolentino, is one of the, the works that we're uh, looking at. She's a, a writer for The New Yorker. And she does this interesting back and forth when she'll look at things like TikTok and how do we understand that uh, in the intersection and in, in conversation with other types of novels. So uh, yeah, we're actually in the midst of adding some of the films in to complement some of the stories as well. Mm -hmm. But you're, uh, you're spot on about that. Abraham. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think that you know, if you think about something like the popularity of Hunger Games, well, Hunger Games is, is, is in a way you could teach that in a course on markets and morality. Um, what is the sort of driving factor here that, that organizes the system uh, that makes such a thing possible in this world. Uh, hugely popular uh, novel, right? Um, and and Mohsen Ahmed, it should be said, is uh, 
is he high culture? Is he low culture? He's been translated into 40 languages and, and as a sort of... Uh, turned best, into films. Best, uh, and turned into films. So, yeah. so I think it's, it's important to realize, I, th I think it's a, it's a great point. Uh, but hopefully through the various literatures that they look at here, they'll realize that all literatures are doing this. Um, low literature, high literature, whatever literature they come across, we're, we're dealing with narratives of, of ethical and economic complexity. So at this point, um, it is unfortunately uh, time to adjourn. Um, obviously, this has been an amazing morning, well worth the drive in, an early drive in. And um, I also think this is a tremendous illustration of why we have universities and what universities can do and how important they are, not just to, the, to, to understanding knowledge, but to really synthesizing knowledge and educating our students in a way that is very difficult to hap, uh, happen any place except at a university. I want to thank um, Professors Baumgarten and Van Egen for a fantastic morning um, and a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you all for attending, and I also want to thank the, the staff of Alumni and Development, both Arts and Sciences and Business School, for a wonderful morning. Thank you for all your work on this.